How do you mean? You don't worry, I'll take care of him. I got a lot of pain in that left ankle. I said, it's a good sign. Yeah. It's that sharp pain uh, that you get when you got nerves, you know. It's that sharp nerve pain. Burning, they, burning. They do all they can to save that leg. I know. I, I know there's not much left because I... Okay. Uh, I was carrying that so damn thing in like my hands all the way back. I was afraid the whole thing was going to come off. For these Marines, 1965 was a year like no other in history. For the first time, Fleet Marine forces were committed to combat in both hemispheres at once. In the Dominican Republic, violence flared, endangering the security of the hemisphere. The Marines were sent in. And in Vietnam, growing communist aggression was answered with the commitment of battle-ready Marines from the Pacific Fleet. quite a year. This is the story of it. The Caribbean in April. Blue water, gentle surf, sunlit, leisurely beaches. Warmth and laughter and fun. But in April of 1965, becomes a scene of violence, unrest, and angry upheaval, endangering the security of the hemisphere. It is a threat which is immediately recognized. The American nation cannot, must not, and will not permit the establishment of another communist government in the Western Hemisphere. On April 28th, word comes to the carrier Boxer that help is needed in Santo Domingo. In moments, Marines of a ready battalion on station in the Caribbean are airborne. Like two other such ready battalions on board ships in the Mediterranean and in the Far East, the unit from the boxer is able to react, literally, on a minute's notice. Twenty minutes after the call for help is received, a spearhead platoon with full combat gear is on the ground in the Dominican Republic. Quickly, the platoon sets up a defense perimeter to assure the safety of the American embassy and of civilians who have taken refuge in the Ambassador Hotel. Immediately, United States citizens are evacuated from the danger area. As the situation in Domingo grows worse, the company follows the platoon ashore. The company is soon joined by the rest of the battalion.
One of the first jobs is to clear a corridor for necessary movement and communications, and to provide a buffer zone, a neutral area between rebel forces and Dominican government troops. it is established, the situation becomes fairly stable. But to wander out of it, even by mistake, can mean trouble. Of four Marines whose jeep wandered out of the corridor, Two are on their way to medical aid. The other two are in less friendly hands. But an angry Marine who's just seen a couple of his buddies hurt does not make the most cooperative prisoner. They, they claim by the radio they took the wrong way, but they were seven blocks away from the international line. They were on the way to the airport seven blocks away from the line. We made a wrong turn. We got up halfway up the street. Your people started shooting at us. You hit one of our men, you almost destroyed one of our vehicles. We will treat you as a prisoner and we'll give you all the guarantees, but you better take it easy. Don't be so arrogant. We will not tolerate it. You come to the United States, you can tell your way around just like that? Um, we have uh, already ordered our radio to announce that we are sorry that by carelessing from the American forces, this situation has taken place where innocent uh, where lives are being lost from their side and from our side. And that we hope that they keep their line to avoid trouble. Snipers are a constant problem, but Marines manage to keep their sense of humor. There was this one guy, <laughs> he couldn't hit anything. Every afternoon, he'd fire a few rounds down our way, and, uh, you know, we'd stay in cover, more or less, but uh, he never came close to anybody. We let him alone. I mean, if we cleaned him out, they might have put somebody in there could shoot. Other times, the sniper problem requires action. As things settle down, the job becomes one of maintaining security. This means, among other things, a constant and careful search of all civilian traffic through the neutral corridor. No hiding place is overlooked which might conceal weapons, the means of renewing violence in the corridor. So the Marines remain in Santo Domingo, ready to stay until the danger is passed and order fully restored. Lieutenant yeah. Kelly, you start infiltrating your people down. Did you, sir? Start infiltrating your people down. Your people down here in front of me now. Golf one, golf one, this is golf six, over. I want more, that was good, he put it right in. I want more over there. Vietnam, a wounded Marine is rescued under heavy enemy fire. His buddy is questioned. <laughs> Whatever possessed you to go running off into the paddy like that? The Marine. How do you mean? The Marine, I'll take care of him. 
Did you carry a weapon with you? I took my 45. Were you not? Weren't you scared? A little bit after I got out there. Combat is never easy, but in Vietnam it is especially hard. One big reason, the terrain. Rice paddies with mud boot top deep or worse. Streams crisscrossing the paddies and valleys. Hills, steep and unfriendly as those in Korea. Desert-like areas where temperatures hit 130 in the shade, and there isn't any shade. And tropic jungle, hot, steaming, hostile as any of the Marines faced in the Pacific during World War II. A prime answer to the near impassability of Vietnamese terrain is the helicopter. Beneath the staccato slap of rotor blades, Marines can move swiftly to wherever the Viet Cong are reported and arrive fresh and ready to function. Of course, to Marines, this is no new concept. It was in the early 1950s that, for the first time, a copter assault was used to take ground in a combat zone. The place, a hilltop in Korea. Combat troops were landed. So were full supplies for their assault. Though it had never been tried before, it had been carefully worked out in advance. The operation was successful. The people who did it were United States Marines. At Chu Lai in the mid-1960s, Navy Seabees clear the way for another Marine Corps innovation, which sees its first combat use in Vietnam. The Expeditionary Landing Field, it's called. ELF, for short. Every element is air transportable, including the preformed sections of lightweight metal, which interlock to form a smooth, all-weather landing surface. Once again, the Seabees make the difficult look easy. They put down 8,000 feet of runway and set up the accessory gear. Lightweight landing control console. Carrier type landing lights. Arresting gear. Air portable control tower. The CBs have, in fact, taken a carrier deck and moved it ashore. Skyhawk jets to arrive are quickly readied for action. Just four hours after the first jets land, they are taking off again to fly their first mission in close support of ground troops in the field. controller with the ground forces is a combat pilot himself. Talking directly to the jets, he pinpoints targets for them. of this direct voice link with airborne jets is this. An absolute minimum of delay between the time ground troops need air support and the time they get it laid in close. The combat success of the expeditionary landing field is another index of Marine Corps mobility. In a matter of days, the landing strip, control tower, arresting gear, the whole works 
could be taken apart and airlifted to another location. For now, however, it's working just fine here at Chulai. Elsewhere, on high ground above the huge air base at Da Nang, Marines man the deadly Hawk anti-aircraft missiles. Enemy air has not yet been a problem in Vietnam, but should it come, the Hawks are waiting. Below, on the field at Da Nang itself, the business of delivering destruction to the Viet Cong in the paddies and jungles is a round-the-clock job. Marine Phantom jets are doing a big part of that job. And it is this kind of weapon system, this complexity and sophistication of striking power, which leads observers to use the term the new breed in speaking of today's Marine. The Phantom can break the sound barrier while climbing out from takeoff and move into action at better than twice the speed of sound. that they can deliver offers wide flexibility too, ranging from bombs and 20 millimeter cannon to rockets and bullpup missiles. The flame and shrapnel of the marine jets is not delivered casually. The necessity to be sure of targets, minimize danger for the innocent, is always agonizingly present. For some, the price of humane hesitancy comes high. Like this Marine Colonel, hit while controlling jet air support from a low-flying copter. I got a lot of pain in that left ankle. I said, it's a good sign. Yeah. It's that sharp pain uh, that you get when you got nerves, you know. It's that sharp nerve pain. Burning, burning. They're gonna do all they can to save that leg. I know. I, I know there's not much left because I... Okay, I was man. carrying that Put damn thing in like my hands all the way back. I was afraid the whole thing was going to come off. I said, hell, they can't be right around in here. So I didn't call bombs and Nathan on these people. Mm -hmm. But that's where they were. I'm sure now that that's where they were. God damn it, I, I hate to put Nape and, and on these women and children. I just didn't do it. I just said... They can't be there. Well, we held the planes. We held the fixed winged up. We held them up there. Just figured we'd call them if we need them. As far as I know, I'm the first to hit, and I I flew down at 100, 200 feet over these over this village, this hamlet area. I thought I saw some people in a hole, and uh, I just hung around there too long, and I was too low. But I was way back out over the over the friendly troops that we landed. I was over those troops when I went, oh, when we caught this round. Mm -hmm. There was no indication that we'd been fired at until then. <sighs> Since all their operations are in coastal areas, the support of naval gunfire is something the Marines in Vietnam can always count on. Marine forces launch a number of large-scale offensive operations. Names like Operation Starlight, Harvest Moon, and Piranha are written into history. In such operations as these, the young Marines of the new breed engage the Viet Cong guerrillas and take on North Vietnamese regulars as well, in numbers up to regimental strength and greater. Using all the advanced weaponry and mobility at their command, the Marines seek out the enemy, and wherever they find him, they beat him decisively. Not just tactical defeat, disaster. Virtual elimination of organized combat capability is the way the official reports put it.
first major trial by fire. Youngsters who were too young even to read about Korea work with a cool professional skill that leads one old timer to remark. Well, the young Marines are just as good uh, Marines today as they were 15 years ago and possibly uh, a lot better as far as intelligence and their capabilities are concerned. They're real fine as far as I'm concerned. Some of the troops went into here just now, though, then. Yeah, the quiet CP is up over here. Right into there? Chopper saves a lot of lives in Vietnam. In minutes, a man can be airlifted direct from combat to an aid station, where the compassionate skill of Navy surgeons is ready and waiting. That's all due till then. Marine casualties have been light in Vietnam, but there is no warfare without its pain, both felt and shared. Marines in Vietnam learn fast to take nothing at face value. Far too often, beneath the outer appearance of a harmless civilian, there is the familiar black garb of the Viet Cong guerrilla. The Viet Cong are not the only problem. In dark little villages, the same ones the Viet Cong have hidden in and operated from, Marines find the people they have come to help. People who have lived for too long in fear. Well, the Vietnamese are a wonderful people as far as I'm concerned. And they need help. And we're a strong nation. And we can give them help. And they've asked for the help. So we're here. Well, I've always had the feeling that if we could get the feeling across to the people of Vietnam that the people of the United States were behind them and wanted them to be free, to have the things that they had been denied for so many years, that we could possibly bring peace to these people. Ten years from now, these people are going to forget the bullets and the shot and the shells and everything else, but they're going to remember this if they don't remember anything else. And I think if we're going to win this war, that we're going to do it here before we'll do it on the battlefield. That's the only way we can win it. People who live out in the rice country, their standard of living uh, is very low by our standards. They have very few comforts. They live uh, from uh, rice crop to rice crop. This is the other war in Vietnam. The one in which American fighting men are working with Vietnamese civilians to build hope and strength for the future. It takes many forms. Standing guard, for example, over the harvesting of rice for a village which for years has paid a big part of each crop to the Viet Cong. Helping them bring it in and store it. Letting them see that they and their crops are going to be safe from now on. It's simple and it's practical. It's appreciated, and it works. In another village, Navy doctor.
doctors and corpsmen serving with the Marine Corps will be found helping the people fight a war against sickness. Teaching the fundamentals of sanitation, waging combat against infection, to faces that for too long have reflected only fear and despair. Uh, we was out in the village below us here, uh, giving out Christmas things that uh, people from the states sent over, and we want to let everyone know back home that the kids, are they really need a lot, and believe me, they really enjoy everything they get. was a year like no other in their history. This has been part of the story of it. Since medieval times, the prisoner of war has been a byproduct of human conflict. Usually he is faceless to all but his relatives and friends, although his general circumstances and treatment may achieve renown. The Vietnam War produced its share of prisoners. More than 650 Americans were captured between 1964 and 1973. But these prisoners did not remain faceless. As year after year passed, virtually every American came to know the name of at least one prisoner one lonely wife, or one fatherless child, because some of these prisoners were in captivity for nearly nine years, longer than any POWs in any other war. During that time, they grew from a few forgotten Americans in an obscure Asian prison to the central figures in the final disengagement of United States forces. This is the story of their captivity. This is a reconstruction of a prison cell in the Hanoi Hilton. Very likely one of the first cells which a newly captured prisoner of war would see. It's a solitary or a solo cell used for isolating POWs. Isolation was a common pressure exerted on US POWs in North Vietnam, with almost all of them spending some months in solitary and a few as much as four years. One newly captured pilot spent his first 1,000 days in isolation, much of it in a cell like this. In the next few minutes, we're going to look in more detail at the conditions of captivity. That is, the physical aspects of the POW environment, the cells, the food, the prison camps themselves, and the treatment afforded by the captor, the interrogations, the physical, and the psychological pressures. More than 650 Americans were captured in Southeast Asia between 1964 and 1973, 
with by far the greatest number being captured in North Vietnam. Nearly all of these men were Air Force and Navy pilots, most of them captured during the bombing over North Vietnam from 1966 to 1968. Those captured in South Vietnam were generally Army and Marine Corps personnel, but as we will see, very few of them were confined in South Vietnam. Instead, they were moved north into prison camps in the Hanoi area. In Laos, U.S. rescue forces recovered many more downed airmen, and there were correspondingly fewer prisoners. Only nine men were returned by the path at Lao. These men had spent only a few weeks in Laos before they too were moved into North Vietnam for detention. None of these captives from Laos or South Vietnam were ever acknowledged as POWs by North Vietnam until the 1973 ceasefire. Of 122 U.S. prisoners returned by the Viet Cong, only 28 were actually released in South Vietnam. These men were all captured in this general area and never moved far from a series of camps in the border regions of South Vietnam and Cambodia. The other POWs released by the Viet Cong had all been captured north of De Lot City and then moved into North Vietnam for detention. These men were sometimes moved in large groups as were the 41 POWs taken during the Tet Offensive of early 1968, while others were moved either individually or in small groups of two to three men. Virtually all followed a northward course, something like this, through the Ho Chi Minh Trail Network. The environment for those POWs held in South Vietnam was primitive. Camps generally consisted of bamboo cages, small huts, and bunkers. Life was hard. The prisoners were often bound or chained for long periods, not as deliberate maltreatment, but as a security measure. Their treatment was usually based on individual camp policy. What happened in one camp had no noticeable effect on treatment in other camps. Movement of the prisoners was frequent and often involved walking for weeks between campsites. Major R.C. Shrump of the Army was held in 12 different camps during five years of captivity. The prisoner's daily routine, which usually consisted of simply surviving from day to day without amenities of any sort, varied little. Exposure to the elements posed a chronic health threat, and medical treatment by trained doctors was virtually non-existent, although some of the Viet Cong served as medical aides. The prisoners suffered constantly from malnutrition complicated by frequent attacks of dysentery, dermatitis, and malaria. Over the years, one out of five men captured died in captivity. Generally, it was more difficult to survive captivity in South Vietnam, but on the other hand, it was not so difficult to escape from camps in the South as from those in the North. There were 26 successful escapes in South Vietnam, representing more than 12% of the PWs captured. This is Hanoi, ultimate destination for nearly all of the Americans captured in Southeast Asia. Lying some 60 miles inland at the core of the Red River Delta, the city contains more than one million Vietnamese and is still studded with 8th century pagodas as well as more recent remnants of the French administration. One of these 20th century architectural remains is Hua Lo Prison, built by the French in the early 1900s. It occupies an entire city block in downtown Hanoi, just across the street from the Ministry of Justice. Hua Lo Prison quickly became known as the Hanoi Hilton in the early days of the war when U.S. prisoners were held in this corner of the camp while the rest of it was used for Vietnamese criminals. American POWs eventually devised nicknames for three major sections of the prison installation. In 1967, the original Hanoi Hilton became known as Little Vegas, when the POWs sardonically named their cells and cell blocks after Las Vegas casinos, Thunderbird, The Mint, Riviera, Stardust, and others. The adjacent corner of the camp was first known simply as Heartbreak, because most interrogations were conducted here. In 1971, it acquired another nickname, New Guy Village, because newly captured POWs, or New Guys, received initial processing in this area. 
the third and largest section of the prison, opened in late 1970 after the raid on the Sante POW camp, became known as Camp Unity, because here all U.S. POWs were housed together for the first time. It was composed of nine large open bay cell blocks surrounding an interior courtyard and exercise area and could hold as many as 400 prisoners. A total of 13 camps were used to confine U.S. POWs in North Vietnam. Eight of these were located outside the city of Hanoi, generally to the west. The Briar Patch, for example, was opened in 1966 in conjunction with the war crimes program being conducted at that time. The North Vietnamese moved some 50 prisoners into this camp and subjected them to continuing pressure in an effort to force them to confess to war crimes against the people of North Vietnam. Dan Hoy Barracks, or Camp Faith as the prisoners called it, was the largest camp opened outside of Hanoi, housing more than 200 POWs in the last months of 1970. During this time, the prisoners experienced communal living for the first time, following nearly six years of continuing effort to isolate them as much as possible. Another camp, nicknamed Dog Patch, was unusual in two ways. First, it was located far from Hanoi and within 10 miles of the Chinese border in a relatively inaccessible area of North Vietnam. Secondly, unlike any other camp used in North Vietnam, it was heavily camouflaged even at ground level so that local villagers would not know of the presence of American POWs. This was probably to ensure that these prisoners would not be lost to a U.S. rescue effort in the last months of the war. Finally, this is a Sante camp as it looked in 1969. The small isolated compound located nearly 25 miles west of Hanoi and outside of the North Vietnamese heavy anti-aircraft defenses was a nearly perfect target for a rescue attempt. On November 20, 1970, a small helicopter-borne assault force landed in the camp hoping to rescue some 50 POWs thought to be held there. Unfortunately, Although the raid was executed without complication, the prisoners had routinely been moved to another camp about 15 miles away. Continued activity by Vietnamese remaining in the area produced all the outward signs of an active prison camp so that the raid was launched against an empty compound. Immediately after the raid, the North Vietnamese hurriedly evacuated all camps outside of Hanoi and moved all prisoners into the Camp Unity portion of the Hanoi Hilton. As we will see later, this centralization of POWs forced the captor to abandon his efforts at isolating and separating the prisoners, and for the first time, allowed the POWs to organize effectively. In general, treatment of U.S. prisoners in North Vietnam can be characterized as falling into one of three major periods. From the capture of the first POWs in mid-1964 until late in 1965, there was little physical mistreatment or torture. To be sure, the POWs were interrogated for military information, but these interrogations, while using physical inducements, such as denial of food and sleep, would not be characterized as brutal, inhumane, or even unusual. But in the fall of 1965, the Vietnamese attitude toward interrogation changed. Not only had their former interrogation techniques failed to produce much usable information, but the North Vietnamese administration had also launched a new effort to exploit POWs for propaganda purposes. Without dire coercion, prisoners were not likely to sign the confessions and the apologies demanded by the captor. And as a consequence, the Vietnamese started a torture program, which was to last for nearly four years. Torture has been defined as the application of pain so intense as to cause loss of consciousness or will. Much of the physical abuse begun by the North Vietnamese in late 1965 fits this definition. Often the prisoners would be forced to, in effect, torture themselves by being made to stand, sit, or kneel for unbearably extended periods. One prisoner was forced to lean against a wall from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. for six and one half days. Another sat on a stool without food or water for over three days. When a man passed out or feigned passing out, he was beaten back into position. The worst physical abuse, however, was that applied directly by the captor, whose favorite accessories were ropes, 
iron bars, and footstocks, which he combined in a variety of ways. Prisoners were frequently fastened by their ankles in stocks. Then their hands were handcuffed behind their backs and their arms bound together with rope from wrist to elbow. Then a longer rope could be run from the prisoner's arms around his body and through the iron bar at his feet to force him into a variety of trust positions depending on the strength and imagination of the guards. In one variation, the rope was tied to the prisoner's elbows and then tossed over a rafter so that the prisoner's entire body could be hoisted off the floor. In some cells, footstocks were used to secure the prisoner to his bed. It was a simple matter for the guards to turn these stocks into an even more rigorous instrument of torture. Floggings were another common form of torture prior to 1969. Prisoners were bound to tables or even trees and then beaten with bamboo sticks or thin strips of rubber cut from old truck tires until they lost consciousness. In some floggings, the prisoner was lashed 800 to 1,000 times. Physical punishments like these were generally combined with isolation, denial of food and sleep, withholding of medical care, and general harassment. Even when mistreatment was commonplace for nearly all prisoners, the captor generally tried to cite a moral justification for the torture. Most commonly, he would create a convenient accusation that one of the camp regulations had been broken. The offending prisoner would be punished for his alleged violation and then allowed to atone for his sins by offering some information or propaganda the captor desired. This was one of the many uses of the camp rules imposed during the earliest days of confinement to form a daily program of humiliation and harassment of the POWs. All U.S. aggressors caught red-handed in their piratical attack against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam are criminals. While detained in this camp, you will strictly obey the following rules. All criminals will bow to all Vietnamese in the camp. All criminals must show polite attitude at all time, or they will be severely punished. All criminals will truthfully answer orally or in writing any question or do anything directly by the camp authority. Criminals are forbidden to attempt to communicate with each other. In Following these four years of very harsh conditions, the third and final period of treatment began in October 1969. This period, the final three years of captivity, saw an end to heavy torture and the beginning of lighter punishment, better food, and generally improved living conditions. There's been much speculation as to the cause of this change, but it was probably due in large measure to pressure by both American and international public opinion, which reached a crescendo during 1969 and 1970. Additionally, the Vietnamese were finding that POW resistance was frustrating many of their propaganda efforts, and that the world at large was labeling their few successes as pure propaganda. Also, a number of prisoners were sick and dying from the poor treatment, and the captor realized he could not allow prison conditions to deteriorate further. Throughout captivity, prisoners were subjected to interrogations, many conducted under the conditions shown here. In the early years of the war, the interrogators were mainly interested in military information such as types of aircraft flown, combat tactics used, and types of weapons employed. In these years, however, interrogations were largely unsuccessful, owing to general ineptness at interrogation, the language barrier, and lack of familiarity with the U.S. military. As an example of this lack of understanding, Navy pilots were often interrogated, or quizzed as the prisoners referred to it, on the supply system required to support the Navy task force in Southeast Asia. These interrogations, however, were often aimed at collecting detailed sketches of aircraft carriers, complete with diagrams of the holding pins for pigs and chickens. Later, the Vietnamese became more sophisticated and knowledgeable and could put much greater pressure on the prisoners. Sign it. Then we will see that your arm is treated immediately. 
You know I can't do that. You are trying our patience, criminal. I've given you all the information. The greatest pressures, however, were usually reserved for efforts aimed at the extraction of propaganda statements. I can't sign it. Although the prisoners were usually successful in evading answers to military questions, there was little opportunity to evade when confronted with a propaganda statement. The prisoner had only two choices, to sign or not to sign. The most extensive campaign of political extortion was initiated in mid-1966 when the Vietnamese began trying to extract written confessions what they termed war crimes. Prisoners were pressured to confess and apologize for violations of North Vietnamese airspace and for alleged bombings of churches, schools, hospitals, and other civilian facilities. The POWs were likewise pressured to praise the good treatment being accorded them and to submit written requests for the forgiveness of the Vietnamese people. The so-called war crimes program was launched with the infamous Hanoi March of July 1966, during which 52 POWs were marched through the streets of Hanoi and beaten, kicked, and stoned by an agitated crowd. Radio broadcasts described the hatred of the Vietnamese people and their demands that the prisoners be tried as war criminals. The only alternative to trial and execution, so the Vietnamese told the POWs, was to confess one's crimes and to assume a proper, that is, a cooperative attitude. In the face of these threats, not a single POW chose to comply. There followed a prolonged period of torture, during which the prisoners were humiliated as never before, and eventually coerced into writing the statements which the captor desired. Visiting delegations, both U.S. and foreign, were attracted by such statements, and all wanted to interview an American POW. These visitors were always taken to one of the showplace camps in Hanoi, where they would be allowed to view selected prisoners. The most frequently visited camp in the early years of the war is shown here and was known to the POWs as the plantation. Men were pressured and sometimes tortured to meet with visiting delegations and to recite memorized accounts of their humane treatment and anti-war sentiments. Prisoners were allowed special recreational privileges for the duration of these visits, as in this basketball game at another showplace camp, the zoo. This particular camp was once a French officer's recreation center and later a major Vietnamese motion picture studio before becoming a prison facility in 1965. Rooms such as these were presented to visitors as typical of prisoner living conditions, when in fact, nearly all POWs were confined at other camps under much different circumstances. Even though the prisoners could be coerced into meeting with visiting groups, they were often able to display very clearly the forced nature of their participation by remaining completely emotionless, and even more explicitly, by casually displaying an outright gesture of contempt for the cameraman. The prisoners were constantly alert for ways to circumvent the Vietnamese efforts at isolation and exploitation, and consequently were usually able to maintain some degree of communication and organization. A major goal of all POW organizations is escape, and the prisoners in North Vietnam were no exception. Escape from North Vietnam, however, was extremely difficult, and there were in fact only several occasions on which U.S. POWs actually launched serious escape efforts. The camps themselves posed no great obstacle. Guard forces were small and not highly trained, and the only barrier to escape was often only a six-foot fence. Once over that fence, however, the tall Caucasian in striped pajamas was hardly inconspicuous on the streets of Hanoi. Once out of Hanoi, he was still faced with many difficult miles of heavily populated territory where his race, language, and size, as well as a hostile populace, would make movement nearly impossible. In October 1967, however, two prisoners did make a daring effort to escape. They found themselves loosely confined in a camp near the Hanoi Thermal Power Plant, with the Red River only a few hundred yards away. Seizing on the opportunity, with almost no advance preparation, the men easily escaped the camp and then entered the river, hoping to float out to sea, where perhaps they could contact a U.S. Navy patrol. 
The men floated downstream throughout the night, covering nearly nine miles before morning. As dawn approached, the two were spotted by fishermen who quickly recaptured them and returned them to Hanoi. On their return to Hanoi, the two escapees joined nine other prisoners, senior men who had been designated as organizers and troublemakers in a new camp nicknamed Alcatraz. This camp consisted of 11 isolation cells located in two small buildings within the North Vietnamese Ministry of National Defense, again located in downtown Hanoi. Within this camp, almost total solitary confinement and 14 hours a day in leg irons would be the rule for nearly 25 months until the major improvement in treatment in late 1969. Another escape was attempted on a rainy night in 1969 when two other prisoners launched a well-planned effort from the zoo. The two escapees left their cell through a hole in the ceiling and then, dressed as Vietnamese peasants, attempted to skirt the western edge of Hanoi, again hoping to reach the Red River and drift out to sea. The men were recaptured the next morning, however, after about 10 hours of freedom. The escapees and some other POWs at the zoo were subjected to days of beatings and interrogations as the Vietnamese tried to purge the prisoner leadership and destroy the prisoner's communication network. This purge at the zoo was one of the last examples of really heavy torture in North Vietnam because in October 1969, after over four years of often brutal treatment, the watershed was reached. The air of generally harsh conditions was replaced with an atmosphere of lighter punishment and improved living conditions. The Vietnamese showed themselves to be very concerned with their world image, as the commander of the Hanoi Hilton became the official scapegoat for the mounting publicity concerning the mistreatment of the prisoners. In a public apology to the people of North Vietnam, he was required to admit his misapplication of the government's lenient and humane policy toward captured personnel. The improved treatment was manifested in many ways. Additional clothing and blankets were issued, the cigarette ration was doubled from three to six per day, and the prisoners were allowed more time outside of their cells. The diet was also improved with the addition of noodles, more meat, and other items to the daily soup. Here is film footage released prior to 1969 by the Vietnamese in an attempt to depict the delicious and appetizing food routinely being served the prisoners. In reality, the POWs received such a meal only two or three times a year on special occasions such as Tet, the Vietnamese New Year, and at Christmas. On all other days, they received only two meals, each consisting of a bowl of watery soup, generally pumpkin, and two small loaves of bread. Medical treatment also improved slightly in late 1969, but again, contrary to the propaganda films as shown here, care was seldom provided in professional hospital facilities. The most common medical problems included burns and fractures suffered during shootdown and capture, as well as dysentery, gastric problems, and intestinal parasites. In the absence of professional medical care, the POWs developed their own remedies for many ailments, such as eating banana peels to control diarrhea and using toothpaste as an antiseptic cream. During 1970, the slow, progressive improvement in treatment continued. Some men, however, continued in isolation in each camp, and the majority of the POWs were not allowed to write or receive letters even after five to six years of captivity. Frequent altercations with the guards continued, usually over the POW's communication activities. At the same time, the POW organization improved in all camps in the reduced pressure atmosphere. In late 1970, as a result of the Sante Raid, the Vietnamese were forced to consolidate all POWs in their most secure prison, the Hanoi Hilton. The prisoners were quick to capitalize on this unprecedented opportunity to consolidate their strength and soon created the organization that would last through the final three years in captivity, the 4th Allied POW Wing. The wing was composed of all 352 U.S. prisoners in the Hanoi Hilton as well as three Thai POWs and a South Vietnamese Air Force lieutenant, thus making it an allied organization. The wing was designated as the fourth because this was the fourth time in this century, after World Wars I, II, and the Korean War, that U.S. servicemen had been in captivity. The goal of the POWs was formalized in the selection of the wing motto, Return with Honor. 
The wing was commanded by Major General John P. Flynn of the Air Force, at that time a colonel and the senior ranking man held prisoner. His staff included representatives of all services and extended down to each room in the Hilton, which was designated a squadron. The organization became quite complex and sophisticated, and as one returnee said, we had everything except a wildlife control officer and probably would have had that in a few more months. The prisoners, of course, did not have access to movies such as My Fair Lady. But some POWs had often seen a particular movie several times, and they became known as movie tellers, one of the prisoners' answers to entertainment. One prisoner, for example, began in the early days of captivity with a simple recounting of the basic plot of My Fair Lady, lasting perhaps an hour. By the end of captivity, he was producing a four and one half hour spectacular, complete with background music and lyrics. Another POW eventually developed an eight hour version of Gone with the Wind. Other prisoners became experts at recounting novels, while others developed complete courses of instruction in subjects such as French, Spanish, American history, art appreciation, philosophy, thermodynamics, and even auto mechanics. These courses were taught not only to cellmates, but to interested prisoners throughout the camp, with lectures being transmitted from room to room by tapping on the walls. The intellectual stimulation of these educational activities was a welcome relief to those men who had spent years in isolation, with nothing to do but exercise, daydream, and observe in minute detail the lives of spiders, lizards, and other tiny creatures sharing their cells. As the prisoners became more and more organized, and thus less susceptible to Vietnamese efforts to exploit or intimidate them, the relationship between the POWs and the captors slowly evolved into a live and let live philosophy. Each side established its own position and then refrained from provocative encroachments on the opposition's territory. The Vietnamese continued to probe the prisoners, however, always alert for an easy opportunity to propagandize or indoctrinate them. From the very first, the Vietnamese were eager to indoctrinate the prisoners in any way possible. In general, their efforts were not aimed at converting the POWs to communism, but rather more simply at lessening their faith in the U.S. government and its role in Southeast Asia. Prisoners were often lectured by camp officials who were always most ready to engage the POWs in philosophical discussions concerning the war. As in Korea, where the Chinese offered POWs the choice of either the reactionary or the progressive path, prisoners in Vietnam were confronted with the choice of the way of LBJ or the way of Ho Chi Minh. Failure to choose the right way meant poorer treatment, torture, and threats of life imprisonment or death. Regardless of the indoctrination technique employed, the POWs were well aware that they were getting only one side of the true story. To combat this distortion of the news, the prisoners sometimes employed a method of news interpretation, which they referred to as 180-degree decoding. That is, they simply believed exactly the opposite of what the Vietnamese said. So, for example, when this news item was reported over the camp radio by Hanoi Hanna, the prisoners calculated that the particular Sunday in question was Easter Sunday, the day of the massive Easter parade in New York, and that the true story was probably something more like this. As we noted earlier, the improvements in treatment beginning in late 1969 allowed the prisoners to recuperate greatly, both physically and mentally, from the preceding years of isolation, mistreatment, and physical abuse. If the prisoners had been released in mid-1969, we would have seen much poorer physical specimens returning from captivity. In the last months of imprisonment, beginning in September and October 1972, the Vietnamese even more markedly improved certain facets of POW life in the face of an imminent peace settlement. Extra food was distributed with special supplements for sick POWs. Men from all squadrons were allowed to mix outside more freely and to play volleyball, basketball, and other games. Some began to receive medical exams complete with chest x-rays. And finally, in the very last days of captivity, the Vietnamese began to recognize and deal with the leaders of the fourth wing, thus allowing the release itself to proceed smoothly under the direction of the wing staff. You've just seen some aspects of the captivity experience in Southeast Asia. What you have not seen, and what we cannot recreate for you, is an accurate portrayal of the intense emotional experiences 
which these men underwent in their many years of confinement. The life of a prisoner is not easy under any circumstances. When considering the major improvement in treatment in late 1969, one tends to conclude that captivity, although very tough before then, became almost bearable from that time on. But for the prisoner, the monotony, the anxieties, the fears, and the uncertainties of captivity continue through even the best periods of confinement. He lives in an environment almost totally devoid of one of man's most precious psychological commodities, a sense of security. That alone can have a tremendous debilitating effect through long years of confinement. One might ask, finally, how did captivity in Southeast Asia compare qualitatively with experiences in other wars? An answer to that question is found in the words of Air Force Colonel Richard Kern, a prisoner in Europe in 1944 and 1945, and again a prisoner for over eight years in North Vietnam. He said, Captivity with the Germans in World War II was rough, but I was treated like a human. My experience in Southeast Asia was completely unbelievable, indescribable, and not of this world. home with a sense of honor, with a pride and a faith in their country which amazed many Americans. But the lesson which they learned and displayed so openly was one instructed by Goethe years ago. What you have inherited from your fathers, earn over again for yourselves, or it will not be yours. These men had experienced a crisis of freedom as few other Americans have. They had been forced to examine themselves closely, to forego the pursuit of ease, and to rediscover the resources of vigor, faith, courage, and imagination, which are required for survival. Intense thought, burning idealism, unlimited sacrifice. These were the attributes that made it possible for these men to return with honor. Thank you.